with action film Occupation Rainfall, as well as Love and Monsters on Netflix. But what happens when you peel off the acting, the cameras and the lights, and completely expose your true self on SAS Australia? Let's find out. Dan Ewing, thanks for joining me. Mate, thank you so much for having me. This is, uh, this is great. Well, first question has to be, why? Why subject yourself to a warts and all mental, physical and emotional, brutal slaying for a better term on SAS? Well, I thought you were talking about living in Sydney at the moment <laughs> compared to where you are, free air. <laughs> That's the <laughs> second question. <laughs> Look, I am, I'm totally, totally, totally uh, obsessed with growth. And I've actually got some mates who serve. One of my good mates, uh, Damien Tomlinson, he lost his, uh, he's lost both legs um, serving in Afghanistan. Oh. And he actually does a bit of acting. He was in Hackshaw Ridge. And, and I just thought, you know, he, he can step into to my world of wearing makeup, very risky. Um, <laughs> but to step, to l really look through the lens of an SAS operative or someone from our military or services, this is the cl as close as I was going to get to do it. So why not? Well, one of the brutal parts would have been uh, exposing yourself to tear gas. I mean, something that I've also <laughs> been exposed to as well in the same sort of setting as you were. Tell me about that experience. Well, I, I think... I said in a previous interview, um, I think they wanted a long-winded question, but I just said they had me at tear gas. Um, <laughs> it's the great leveler. So it doesn't matter whether you're the smallest recruit in, say, Bonnie Bonnie Anderson or the biggest in, say, Sam or Mark Philip Pusis. It's the great leveler. Um, and it's quite fascinating to see how some people's bodies cope with it as opposed to others. You know, you wouldn't think that some of the like, biggest and strongest people really suffered with it. But it was... Um, I can't imagine what just you, you start having thoughts after about people going through that and not in a let's call it a, a, a very safe scenario because it was a safe scenario um although, although albeit dangerous um and yeah a little scary we'll call it scary but to, to go through that i cannot imagine what it would be like in real life in the uh, promos and in in i think it's the first episode you spoke to camera in one of the scenes mm -hmm. saying what would dan ewing do if he was if his back was against the wall well, you've been on SAS now, so what would Dan Ewing do if his back was against the wall? Well, uh, we, we, can, we can't give too much away, but I, I'm very proud of what I did with my back against the wall. Look, I, I, I like to set an intention. Some people call it a goal. Uh, that, goal was, that goal was to pass the course. So I'm, I, I obviously I can't let you guys know if I did or I didn't, but I'm, I was very content um, in, the, in what I achieved on the show. Um, I'll say that, um, and that doesn't mean I passed, doesn't mean you know, I didn't pass, but it's, um, it, for me, it was just about giving it my absolute best. And I felt when I left there, I was, I was very, very content. And yeah, I wasn't, I don't feel I'm one of the people who um, thought, oh, maybe I should have waited a bit longer to have a cup of tea in a Tim Tam. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people in the industry say that you're friendly, personable, charming, just a really nice guy. I mean, how does that compare to having to be really serious on SAS. That's actually great. It's funny you say that. I actually struggled sometimes with some of the serious moments. I um, I try to keep a sort of a neutral head because I've spoken to my mates in the military and it's because it's their job, their, the DS's job is to rattle you and take you out of your comfort zone. So I try to stay as neutral as possible, not too high or too low. But some of the, the physical things, especially when they started pitting recruits against each other, I struggle with that because I'm a big team player. Like I was just like, and you want me to do what to my my buddy here you know i really yeah i struggled with that and having that that fire with some of the athletes they could switch it on and off mm. um so that was fascinating fascinating sort of awareness or experience for me um but yeah it, it was was quite quite confronting shall we say with some of the tasks we had to do against each other and all of a sudden oh cool we're sitting next to each other in the dunning <laughs> <laughs> A couple of scenes where you had to, to strip down in the show, there's obvious mm. reasons why they do that. It's, it's to strip away the ego more than the clothes themselves. Mm. Um, you've had to have your shirt off before in, in other roles, but can I only imagine that those scenes are very different to what you, you do at SAS? Was it any less or more comfortable than in acting roles? 
Um, interestingly, yeah. I mean, it's funny. I haven't thought about this before. Great question. Um, obviously, with acting stuff, that it's it's they molly coddle you. You know, it's coming. Like, how are you feeling? Might be a closed set, depending on how much you're showing. You know, closed set for everybody at home. It's it's like a skeleton crew kind of thing. But to be out there um, with 18 people, some of them you've met, but most of them you haven't. And just strip naked, yelled at. It's not like a being on a film set. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no like wardrobe assistant running in with a towel as soon as they yell cut or or, or what have you. And um, and just to be, yeah, to, to be that open and exposed in uh, in a in, in just the setting that we were in um, in in Glen Davis where we, where we shot. It was just it was quite daunting actually. You would think that I oh, he, he had his shirt off for three years on home and away. There's no problem, but it's uh, it was it was quite confronting. You you seem to um to come across with with a series as being the team encourager like you know you're doing really well um you know you just said before that you're a sort of a team player those kind of uh, comments and you know encourage encouraging and motivating people did you realise that you were taking on sort of a leadership role in that capacity? Well, I knew what I didn't like and what I, I did like about leaders. Um, I'm a huge sports nut, huge sports nut. So. First and foremost, to be in that environment with Olympians, I knew that I probably wouldn't be quote unquote leading, especially the physical challenge. You know, it's like the guy always make up for a living. You know, always make that joke. But <laughs> I know what I'm good at in my position that I play in basketball, and that's playing point guard. And that is basically to get your team involved and to to identify people's strengths and maximizing those for team success. So I, I sort of approached it that way. Um, and you just have to. I mean, there was something I really, really loved about the show was it was literally, it was you and them. So it's your own mind, which is obviously the biggest part, and the people around you to get you through this um, experience of pain and torture and blood, sweat and tears and tear gas. Um, but it it was, I, I, I love that aspect of it. And just, yeah, so getting around each other if people were struggling and obviously the whole point of the show was struggle and getting over it, getting through adversity. So it was great. In terms of the mental staff, um, a small example um, part of the show, the DS staff give an instruction that says, when I say go, I want you to pick up your bag, I want you to do this or whatever. Then some participants pick up their bags straight away and, you know, and, goes off his absolute brain because the instruction mm. was when I say go yeah but from a viewer point it, it does seem simple he did say wait until I say go however I could in the moment I could imagine is it hard to focus or is there so many things running through your mind that that people just can't hear any like yeah, an instruction because like you're that. in a state of um not to go too far down the rabbit hole of neuroscience but you're in a state <laughs> of hyper hyper stress so the part of the brain the amygdala that is in charge of fight or flight. You're, you're flooded with stress hormones. So what that does is it's it's you're, you're ready to run, fight or hide, right? So you're you're ready to run away from the T Rex or the saber tooth tiger. So everything's on high alert. You know, like stressful people, they're quite jittery and all that sort mm. of stuff. I'm doing weird <laughs> hand motions for everybody listening. <laughs> jittery, you know, a jittery, anxious person in your life. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're you're constantly in that state. Doing your back in your armchair, and we've all done it. Like uh, watching athletes or watching TV shows. Oh, I would have done that. Done that. But when you're flooded with those stress hormones, it's like all you you might hear little bits of information. And like I said, it's run, fight, or hide. So you're ready to run. You're ready to go. You don't want to be last. And they've just told you a second before, do not be last on this task. And they're they're whipping you if you're last and all that sort of stuff. So it's um it's certainly 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 a great it was a great experience because you always think that don't you when you're watching sports shows or, or whatever you think i would have done that no you wouldn't have. <laughs> Guarantee you wouldn't have. definitely not um for, for me in this show having seen a number of episodes um mm. you have the look the same one i recognized in nick cummings aka the, the honey badger when he did the show just a look of sheer focus and determination now that is usually a winning trait i, I don't know anything i don't know if you win or how far you mm. go but how are you channeling the, the mental grind of a show like this? Um, so I, th I said it before, I set an intention and that was to pass the course. And I just, I know for myself mentally, you call it a goal, you call it a call it intention or whatever. The mind sets a blueprint. Um, so I can tell the people on the show who didn't set a blueprint. They said, I'd be happy if I got to day whatever. And they got to day whatever and their mind said, you're done. And then they VW, right? I knew I couldn't do that just for me. I'm not knocking anyone, by the way. That I, just, I just know it works for me in my life. I need to set a clear intention or a goal and then take steps towards that. That's just me. You know, some people are like, you Muppet. 
<laughs> Why do you need to do that? It's like, because I'm a Muppet. <laughs> because I'm an actor. No, it's, um, I just find that, so that that sort of stuff really worked. And I could tell the tasks that I smashed when I had that focus and I had that drive and I really honed in on that and just concentrated. I can tell the things where I was too placid. And that was a great learning experience for me. You know, I, you know, it's, <laughs> the, I, I think I'm going to come out of the show looking like the, um, I was going to say meditating, but it's almost levitating. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the actor wearing Birkenstocks and walking across water or something. But <laughs> it's, um, it's, um, it, I could tell when I was too placid, and I need you need to be able to unlock that um, competitive edge, that controlled aggression, like the DS talk about. There were certainly times where I was, I was too relaxed and I was kind of flopping around, and that that doesn't work on the SAS course. Yeah. I'm not sure this one how spoilery this question is, but there's mm. always um, something that the DS uh, expose in each person. It might be fear, it might be doubt, it might be mm. childhood trauma, it might be anger. Are you able to mention, I guess, what was exposed in you or, or a weakness that they thought? Um, what, what did um, the DS uh, find challenging? No, I think with me, they were just like unleash that, like that inner, I think with actors a lot of the time, I'm certainly I'm I'm super super genuine and super um, open and anyone who looks at my social media I, I talk about everything, um, past experiences absolutely anything. But sometimes I, um, I I one of the interesting little tidbits I learn about myself is just kind of what I touched on before. It's all good to like have your journal and 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 meditate and be calm and be chill and be t- a team guy and positive. But it dep- if you're in an SAS course and you need to have that sort of controlled aggression, like at a, a boxing thing or, you know, or because uh, controlled aggression also just narrows your focus and you attack a task. Sometimes I was way, way, way too placid. So a lot of the time they were trying to help me sort of, it's okay to do that. You don't always have to be sort of a team guy and, you know, and super, um, super chilled. So yeah, that was a interesting part that like, <laughs> <laughs> and boy, do they try to whip it out of you. My gosh. <laughs> I can't wait for everyone to see. It's just such a, it's such a great, great fun show. And just seeing people who you know, who you've seen before in other uh, other arenas, just getting absolutely smashed. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Well, talking about some of the other people, is, is there anyone you like you clicked with during the show that perhaps you, that you've kept that rapport going since leaving the show? Is there any special bonds in there? Yeah, well, we've got a, a great chat, a very funny group chat. So at the moment, um, this is insight into the recruits. Uh, we're sharing around funny uh, inboxes we get from people. Uh. <laughs> There's some very, very creative uh, Aussies out there. So on that note, I would just advise anyone who watches the show, just be kind in the comments. Don't send rude DMs uh, <laughs> because you're going to end up in the group chat. No, um, <laughs> I think, do you know what? The honest, honest answer is it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a, a drama show that's very produced and scripted, you know, um, you know, or a reality show that's a, a date, let's call it a dating reality show um, that's scripted. It's, there was actually no, no one argued. People had these great different points of view and opinions, but we were very, very lucky with the people we had. Um, very lucky and everybody was conveyed their opinions but there's none of that that cliche telly drama you know the only drama was from the voiceover guy who scares the crap out of me mm-hmm. I, like, I, I work in the industry and i'm like man that voiceover guy really sells this <laughs> i'm not going to mention it but there were a few things uh, after episode three people might want to tune in there was a yeah. yeah, a few, few things going on with a few of the, the celebs, but um, but there definitely were a number of different personalities though in this season. It'd be mm. interesting to having all you guys on uh, Big Big Brother together. That would be interesting. How did it go living with so many different kinds of people? Oh, I loved it. I mean, I because you can remember my line of work is people is transforming mm. into different characters. So I was just a junkie for it, you know, for want of a better term. I um, I loved, loved, loved it, and for me. Because being a sports nut, I mean, it's always great to hang out. Like Manu and I, we did the same series of Dancing with the Stars. Uh, I'm still oh, so angry that he took that Mirrorball trophy. It just affects me every day. And I know bro, I met Bryn before, but yeah, across, across the board, just being, for me, being, uh, again, for want of a better term, on top of Olympians for a couple of weeks. I mean, just think about that. For being a sports nut, to be there with Olympians, and it's not like you're hanging out with them at an event or seeing or having a chat at at something it's you're literally living with them so to see what olympians do mate like their their mental mindset and process um that for me was just unbelievable everyone like every and yeah just seeing yana and talking to yana Pittman, who's like a mother of four and then she's a doctor as well and she was an olympian i'm just there going 
oh yeah, I uh, I wore fake tattoos for three years and now I do movies. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that can you imagine? Like me, I was like, I was just having a ball. Hey, just a question about the the challenge. When you pass a challenge uh, or a challenging mm. obstacle on the show, is it just relief? Because I ask that because for for some, you can see that the achievement was more than just the obstacle. It was almost like they'd broke free from something that was inside of them, like for their whole life. <laughs> How was it for you? Is passing something just okay? Yep, I passed it. That's great. Move on to the next one. Or is it? Mm. Or is there more to just passing one of those? You know, the the big big obstacles. <clears throat> Well, uh, it depends how it depends if it's a, if it's a true fear or phobia. So, I say it on the show. I mean, it always looks good in the trailer. I have no fears. What a what a wanker that guy is. Sorry if anyone's uh, <laughs> offended by that language. Um, but I don't have any phobia. Like, everyone's afraid. Like if I if I have a gun pointed to my head, of course I'm going to be scared. If I'm looking over a cliff, of course I'm going to be scared. Uh, if I'm about to be dunked in the water in a in a car, you know, and have to escape, I'm going to be scared. But I have no phobias. To watch the people triumph over their phobias, I'm talking about claustrophobia, you know, the, the, the fears of heights, <laughs> fear of tear gas. I, I think we all have a fear of tear gas <laughs> um, now. But to see them triumph for me, that's the most special stuff because you see how paralyzing it is. Um, uh, Bonnie Anderson, she deals with a particular one. Um, I think it's going to be episode three. It's all a blur for us in there. We don't know how to episode three. Um, she she has a real fear of drowning, an absolute real fear. And just to... The, to overcome some of the stuff she did on that show, I, I was so so proud of. But everyone did. Everyone had a you know. I, feel, I think we've all got a fear of mice. That's a little tidbit. <laughs> a little a little tidbit. There's there's been some clues about the mice that's been leaked on our on the recruit social media. There was a, a, a media package we got sent from the network with a puzzle and a little toy mouse. That'll all make sense very soon to everybody at home. I've got I've got the puzzle too. Now maybe it'll make sense when that comes up too. Um, yeah. one of the, there's, one a, there's, of a, the, few, there's a few critters. <laughs> one of the, uh, challenges, the, one of the celebrity, it was a female said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Was panicking and so on. But then eventually they did it. And the DS staff simply said, you said you couldn't do it. You panicked and, mm. and, and it got into your head. Just, just get your head together. Is it that simple? Just get your head together. Well, well, it is, it is. So you can do anything theoretically, right? Um, with a, a click right with a decision and most things in life can be solved with a decision but our subconscious programming again this is the neuroscience rabbit hole that i've, that I've gone down we're 93 percent habitual right so and that habitual behavior our subconscious programming is designed to keep us safe again the saber-toothed tiger the the t-rex so it's it can be anything like there's there's, there's no saber-toothed tiger anymore it could be anxiety or a business meeting or seeing or your ex or at, at, at something or what, whatever it is, we all have those fears and our brain is designed to keep us safe from those things. Um, but what the DS tried to do is it's just, it's a fear barrier and you've got to crash through that. On the other side of that is heaven. It's absolutely heaven. And believe me, from seeing these, uh, uh, from seeing people go through this, and obviously myself, I was had the bejesus scared out of me. Um, <laughs> but seeing people who got over, uh, who, who really triumphed over one of their phobias, you can actually feel the energy radi radiating off them. You can feel it. You know, it's um, it's not quite the purple aura around. Maybe some people could see that. I can't. But it's just the the elation and relief and their you know their 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 physicality is different. You start they're very hunched over and she I can't I can't I can't and by the end of it they're walking chin up and you know all that sort of stuff. I've mentioned Bonnie Anderson before had this little swagger about her kind of thing. It's um it's it's such a beautiful beautiful show um about triumph over adversity. It's fantastic. It, it definitely does come through on screen. You do actually feel mm. it. It's 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 amazing. Yeah. Now, you're physically fit by I guess looking at you, but I suppose how physically physically fit are you is not really known until you get a beasting on SAS Australia. So Dan, <laughs> how physically fit are you? Um, I thought I was reasonably fit. I mean, I've gotten in shape physically for roles, but I, I think people now know this show is not about being physically fit. It doesn't matter whether you're you know, Dan Ewing, Brent Olsen, Manu or big, big Sammy. It's like the physical stuff. Don't get me wrong. It does help. It does help. And it means they probably yell at you a little bit less. Um, but it's the mental game, man, the mental, 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 mental game. Like you've got to be, you know, I, I think I talked about it a lot in the show. It's like there's, you know, I'm not waking up and doing my journal with my little boy, my gratitude journal, my little boy and meditating. You've got to find other ways in the military. They call it box breathing um, 
or you know in the, a lot of people call it sort of visualizing visualizing what you're going to do just to sort of quiet it quiet in your mind but that's very hard when you're like the whole point of this course is to put you in a state of stress so you know it's finding a moment to take to take a few deep breaths and just you know get out of that sort of stress environment and everyone else's stress you know you got 18 other people who are sort of radiating that vibe as well so it was a fascinating challenge but it's yeah it's all mental physical yeah but it's all mental well the, the mental part there is some uh, meditation uh, mm -hmm. from you in the series and you, you you talk about that in the series how mm -hmm. does meditation work for you in your daily life are, are you spiritual or religious perhaps or what, what yeah yeah yeah. so this is actually good i love this question um because meditation to me was a it was kind of taboo you know like no i didn't knock it i understood it i think it's great but i thought it was you know the hippies at byron bay under the tree <laughs> you know i did i see i did and, and even mental health it wasn't taboo i just didn't understand what it meant so I explained to her, this is the way that kind of, um, you know, my mum's a scientist, right? So from, from just from a neurological perspective, right? When you, 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 you wake up in the morning, your stress hormones are the highest, your cortisol levels are the highest. So by meditating, by visualizing, just by doing, you know, just say four deep breaths, right? In, in, hold, and then out, four deep breaths, just cortisol levels drop. And then your your brain will release sort of dopamine and serotonin and all those lovely things that that are, that are great. And it just starts the day off, right? So I started by calling it. You love this, like my seven year old would. I started by calling it my quiet time because I didn't want to say meditation because I was like, oh, I don't meditate. I'm a bloke, kind of meditate. Quiet and then time. I started really like LeBron James, the best basketball player in the world, meditates and visualizes. And you start reading it, and like, there's a lot of successful people out there who do this stuff. Yeah. Um, but if anyone out there is is thinking about it, just just Google guided meditation. It doesn't have to be an hour of your life. I started off by doing 10 minute ones and it's weird. It's uncomfortable, but it absolutely changes your life. It's just a few minutes of your day. First thing in the morning is what I would recommend. Um, and then look, it may, and who knows, once you get good at it, maybe you can do it on the SAS course and have Foxy saying, are you effing meditating in your face? <laughs> Which is it's on the trail. <laughs> got me good. I've got to say, got me good. I was going to mention something. There's a time and place for meditation. Um, yeah. It's, they all meditate. This is the thing, right? The DS all meditate, especially Ollie. Um, but it's like, it's got a time and place because what I was doing, we were just about, we we're about to do a task and there's a lot of waiting around, right? It's TV, 18 people doing the one task. And if there's a helicopter involved, there's a lot of resetting, right? You're spending the day there with 18 people trying to get this task done. So I was just, I know everyone's nervous. So I just tried to close my eyes and visualize what I was going to do. So, you know, like I said, LeBron James does it before a basketball game or, or whatever for his assignment during, during that game. So that's what I was doing, but it does look kind of funny, right? Imagine that in a war zone, like who's this Muppet meditating while the enemy are coming over the hill. So yes, time and place. All right, let's go in a whole different direction. We've we've spoken about SAS. There's a few other things going on in your life too. Um, you, you were in Occupation, the film in 2018. Mm. Was it just me, or did they really turn up the budget and technology for the for the second one? I mean, it was only a, a couple of years later, or three years later, mm. for Occupation Rainfall. Well, it, it's it's amazing when you have a successful movie, the studio tends to want to give you more money for the sequel. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it was great. It was such a because sci-fi still it's it's successful here, but it's still like a, a small niche market. Over in the US, it was shot to the top. So Occupation, the, the first movie, shot to the top of the Netflix charts and sort of stayed there for a few weeks. So then Lionsgate um, got on board and said, right, go and make a sequel for 25 million bucks. The first was about seven. So then we were able to bring in sort of King Jeong and Jason Isaacs and Daniel Gillies and uh, Tamora Morrison, who's now sort of, uh, he's reigniting the, the Star Wars, um, um, his Star Wars character in Boba Fett. So, and then we, we, we've, we've done that. And then that's been, that's been the top of the charts for, so that was top of the Apple TV charts over in the U S for, I think it was about a month and it's done extremely well overseas. So it's a, a very, very exciting time for that little franchise. I know that, you know, there's the, the filming part of it is, is not as, as, as fun, I suppose, as, as, as a viewer watching it, but I mean, is it as fun to film as it looks? I mean, you're going around shooting like baddies and alien mm. <laughs> it's, it's as fun more, as it looks it's more fun than sas australia uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh it's great and i um you know it's i i just love i love like again i love the team environment i love leading movies uh, to be the lead of that film with a cast like like you look i look at the imdb of it it's like number one dan ewing and then it's like you know and then sort of down from that it's like gee whiz i'm team captain of this monster of a film with this cast it really um, it's pressure, but it's also a great honor, um, to do that sort of thing. Um, but it's so fun. I mean, come on, you know, it's my, 
it's it's like you're, you're doing these stunt sequences and there's explosions and like just and to have the big toys i mean anyone who knows film and tv to get the the big exciting toys and camera cranes and to have we had a hovercraft for goodness sake mm. you know it was it was amazing and do you see yourself as as the leading man now have you stepped out of the shadows you you are the leading man you accept that oh, well i've led most of the films i've done um mm. but i think now it's more of an international stage so yeah there is certainly global um a much more sort of global uh, awareness of me um mm. and we we're quite patient with that so after home and away what some actors choose to do is they'll jump on, you know, like a one of the sort of CWE network shows. And that's they're great, you know, like a flash or an arrow or something like that. And um, whatever. I really just I just knew I love feature films so much. There's something about film for me with the narrative, the beginning, middle, and end. Um, and the you know, that objective, but the TV formula I wanted to break out of a bit. I just felt like I loved it, but I wanted to 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 mm. hold off on that. So to be cast as the lead antagonist. Uh, sorry, spoiler spoiler alert. Um, the lead the lead uh, antagonist in Love and Monsters, a film that size um, as my I would say sort of coming out party uh, for want of a better term in the US market. It was it, it huge, huge, and it took patience. I had to knock back a few things that would have been really nice for the bank balance and would have been great fun and 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 whatever. But to to have that patience, um, many sleepless nights <laughs> talking to agents back and forth, just be patient, be patient, you know, but I set yeah. that a, an intention a few years ago of not settling and not mm. that things are settling, but I made a choice for me of what I wanted to do and accomplish in my career. So, you know, to be rewarded with Love and Monsters being the number one movie in the world for April and May on the biggest platform in the world wow. in, a, in a pandemic, you know, I, I was just, it was stunned. You know, I still, again, I, every now and then I'll, I'll get a, I'll do an interview or have a request about, you know, talking about Michael Rooker and Dylan, Dylan O'Brien being in that film with me. I was like, oh yeah, I was in a film with those blokes. That was mm. great. <laughs> I was going to ask you about, you know, about how big the film is, but you've, you've, you mentioned that. But with Love and Monsters, um, which is, as I said, on Netflix, great film. I watched it last night, and I would say that it was a cross between maybe Lord of the Rings and Men in Black. Mm. Um, I mean, how would you describe the film? Oh, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a real homage, I think, to the '90s sort of action adventure films. It's like. Like I think with with a film when it's the title's Love and Monsters, yeah, like, here we go. But it's I think the guys at Twenty One Laps, so they do Stranger Things. So if that for everybody at home has seen Stranger Things, they're they're masters of tone, and they don't just do insert you know teen action adventure here. They really add a lot of interesting layers. I'm sure you'll agree it wasn't your cliche in the middle there. It's um it's a really really great narrative. Um, sure, plenty of action adventure, but there's a lot of heart in it, and some some great humor, and one really great haircut. I'm sure you'll attest to that. Well, that, woo, Yeah, the nice One wavy, week. long sort of Ooh, yeah, haircut. And yeah, it, this is a great film and TV story. That was actually meant to be much longer, but I thought they thought my character looked too much like a Viking. So then end up being that, um, what can only be described as Andrew G when he was Andrew G before he changed his name back to, to Ginsburg. Yeah. Do, do, do you think that? Is that a good, is that a good comp? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that, that, go with there that, go. yeah. Um, well, G'day to, to get it, Andrew um, Ginsburg, by the way. Osha, sorry, Osha. <laughs> Osha. Um, people being attacked by King Kong sized crabs or frogs in the movie is kind of bizarre, but it's a lot of fun. But mm. also, it's, it's another side of you. Uh, it's a more darker, as in a serious, but also dark comedy, sort of. Because uh, mm. it's a, sort of a big, it's, it's a weird kind of way to put it but um yeah, are, black are, comedy are, economies yeah. are, are you enjoying the uh, versatility of, of your roles now so it's comedy action mm. there's soap in there there's everything i mean you know yeah no, I, I love it i think as as actors you all you want you want obviously a established um ongoing career of excellence and, and success i'm not overly biblical person i'm spiritual but i i love as a passage as i can do all things and i think as actors you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, people can make a lot of money doing the sort of one genre. But for me, I just love the transformation aspect because that's what I do things that scare um, the crap out of me. I love that. I love I I love going, well, I can't just look at my um, Ivana Chubbuck book technique thing here and set this clear objective here. And this I, I love going, how am I going to accomplish this? This character is so conflicted. And why are they doing this? And yeah, I don't like a formula. Formulas are just like, I, I don't like it being too easy. As a viewer, I don't like knowing what's going to happen and formulas and all sorts of stuff. So be a, uh, yeah, I love stuff that challenges me. So yeah, that's for sure. So if you had to 
sort of pick a movie? What, what, what kind of movies would you like to be in in the future? Um, what kind of roles? What, what, what's that maybe an example of something that's already been out? Great, that you great like question. To... I've got a few things I want to tick off. Um, I love, because I'm just I'm such a huge fan of Gladiator. I would love to do a sword, uh, swords and sandals thing, but not just. It can't. But I'm so action. Action must be secondary to good character. I'm a Nazi for that. Um, um, and I've got a, so a bucket list. I've always wanted to do a, a Jurassic Park thing, um, just because <laughs> of the the franchise. The franchise is so like I still listen to the the soundtrack because it makes me it gives me that sort of inner child of love of movies. Anytime I start drifting into like it's a job mode, I start listening to soundtracks from when I was a kid. Um, but I loved, love, love, love to do just a real, um, in fact, I'm about to start a, uh, I've got a project coming that's, it's just where I'm playing, I'm playing two different characters, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that for me, I always, I've seen Tom Hardy is, is a master at that. Um, uh, in here. Yeah. It, it, so just for me, that sort of challenge of how do you do that? How do you step? Cause it's not just, you can commit to one character and, and see you later. You know, shooting schedules are very different. They can try to help you out, but that that is going to be a, a very big challenge. I'm looking forward to that. Maybe a um a suggestion for a challenging role. You're talking about a Vikings type thing. I mean, Jason Momoa is in an Apple series called C, and it's kind I of like the, the Viking series, but they're all blind, <laughs> so they're all fighting sort of, um, yeah. and not not knowing where they're going. That'd be an interesting show to film. I, I would imagine. I love. Um, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's one of my favorites because it's like it's kind of taking a Game of Thrones vibe and taking it to a whole new level. So I love things that are different. Um, yeah. So for example, like when I say like formula, like I, I love what that's very good for the, for the, um, for audience members, but you know, like your meat and potato shows where, you know, there's going to be, you know, it's like a, it'll be a, um, the cop show. It's like CSI this or this or whatever. Great shows. I used to watch them. But for me, I go, Oh, there's a, I know they're going to get the guy at the end or they might take two episodes to do it. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I just love not knowing what's going to happen. You know, like breaking bad for me, that sort of thing or true to true detective, for oh, me, yeah. I just, yeah, I love kind of feeling challenged and unease and really invested in, in what happens. And that's hard as an actor because you kind of, you work in the business, you know, there's cameras and makeup and producers and directors there. So for me, when I'm really sort of, when I, they can really invest and engage me, that's the shows I love. I know when you do interviews, you get lo asked lots of questions about Home and Away. So I'm only going to have just mm. the one question, only the one. Um, so... Uh, Many celebrities look back um, on their soap roles in different ways, some with fondness and always they always connect with, with that um, right through to the people that just, I want to forget it, never mention it. Where do you fall on the spectrum? I can't stand people like that, man. I loved Home and Away. I love Home. I love the people on there. I love the show. Um, I just, I, I, I think people forget that it is Australia's favourite drama and it, it kind of, it runs Channel 7. That might be a taboo thing to say, but that show runs their whole network, you know? And I just think it is such a fantastic show with amazing people and just the, what they can do in the time they get it in. I, I love, I, I went back and did a cameo, which is like, oh, you went back, like, like, and people were acting like it was a big deal. I'm like, oh, I love that show. It was, they're so, they're so fantastic. And I was picking up conversations I'd had four years ago, you know? Mm. Um, what they do, I, I don't think that show gets enough credit, and the people get enough credit. But I, um, I don't, I don't. Well, everyone's got entitled to an opinion, but I don't connect with people who look back on their time uh, or frown frown on their time. I love it. I look back and love it. I still stay in touch with crew members just as much as I do with cast and what the showrunner Lucia Dario does there and Louise Bowers, their script producer. It's uh, it's amazing. I mean, imagine turning turning out that much storyline every single episode and having to shoot it in a beautiful way that looks appealing that's not just you know it looks like a cheap studio show you know mm -hmm. so i tip my hat to them second last question um how are you going with the acting industry in terms of COVID? there's a lots of pressure on crews um lots of mm. people out of work i mean how's the industry and your friends and you going mm. getting through it all well, first and foremost, big g'day to everybody out there who might be suffering. Yeah, um, there's yeah. a lot of people doing a lot worse off than me. Um, I'm, I stay positive. Uh, I've, I was very lucky. I've got, a, I've got quite a few projects in the can. And look, for me, it's more about uh, things might be shifted 
yeah and i'm lucky that i can i've been doing this professionally for a while and i haven't had to do a quote unquote day job i've got mates who are living in la that were sort of you know gigging actors they might do an episode here or a gig or a movie there or whatever but they still have say a day job and then that day job gone you know in the blink of an eye because they work in hospitality or at a gym or whatever mm. so i really feel for those people um you know and obviously there was a lot of civil unrest over in the states and what have you but Look, for me, it's the, the border thing at the moment. The biggest thing is my little boy's in Queensland and I'm in Sydney. So, uh, you know, I can focus on that uh, being a negative or, you know, and it, look, don't get me wrong, I'd always much rather be there with him. But we get together every morning at 7.30. We do a little gratitude journal. He writes down three three things he's grateful for. Uh, uh, and I do the same. And we so that's our little moment of connection. So if anyone out there is suffering with that sort of stuff and they are separated by families, just set a time every day where you can do something along those lines. You don't have to do a gratitude journal. Or it's fantastic for kids. I can't recommend it enough. Um, but don't focus on the suffering. Don't focus on being apart. Focus on on what you do have. You know, I had Father's Day and Archie's birthday on the same day on Sunday. Uh, you know, so I could focus on, oh, it's Archie's birthday and it's Father's Day. Oh, down the nuts. Or, okay, hey, look, it's my son's birthday and it's Father's Day. I'm the luckiest man in the world. I love my little boy and he's in Queensland, having a great time in Queensland. Well, I'm in Sydney, locked up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, that's not how you see it. I'm stuck on that, the little journal. That's beautiful. To, to, well, it changed my life. It, it, changed, yeah. it changed my life, mate. So what, I always just think it's funny when actors or people like that or people in the public go, I want to change the world, this. You know, start with your own backyard. Start with yourself, right? So I changed my life just doing that. And then I was like, I'll just do it with my little boy, a little moment of connection every day. And, um, yeah, I've, I've shared it and people have come back and it doesn't matter how uh, uh, how big and strong and ugly <laughs> you are or if you're a, a little little cute princess on her way to school, being grateful and appreciative for what we have is really important, especially in times like this. I mean, we live in the best country in the world. Now we've got clean water, free health care. Obviously, what we're going through at the moment sucks. But you know what? My little boy and his mum aren't in Queensland trying to jump on a Qantas jet to escape the country, are they? Mm. You know, so I think we need to remember we're pretty lucky here. You know, oh, that would have been a beautiful note to end on. But I, I did also just want to ask what's coming up for you next. So if, um, you know, mm. people know what, what, where to see you next. Uh, on SAS Australia season two, crying. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, IMDb is a, a little sneaky giveaway uh, of what I'll be doing next. I can't leave. I'm not supposed to say anything uh, just verbally, but IMDb does. And then there's another uh, American thing that, again, I can't talk about because you know what, mate? I'll tell you one thing. Studio lawyers scare me. You know, there's one thing I've learned, <laughs> I've learned in my time. They're very expensive for a reason. No, I, I just, I'm very, very lucky, very happy for the next stage. And very, just very grateful for all the opportunities that all the films I've done have sort of opened a lot of doors and, and, and have led down this path. Um, um, but yeah, like I said, I, I always look back on my time on Home and Away and, and especially now this new sort of uh, this experience with SAS. It's really set me up for what's to come. So I'm very grateful for all that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm intrigued to see your journey. I'm on SAS and can't wait. What, uh, Whatever projects are coming up next, you, you know, you've hinted at a few, but um, looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Mate, thank you so much for your time. And just for everyone playing at home, you have the best gaming chair and setup I've <laughs> ever seen. I'm not a gamer, but I just thought I'm going to snitch on you. There is some, there's, there's headphones that look like you could be like taking off in some sort of NASA rocket and that chair looks like it's come out of a like f1 so formula one car okay <laughs> so that's everyone at home he's not in his palace he's in his his hub ready to take anybody on <laughs> <laughs>